this Mazda CX-90 is the biggest, most powerful and most expensive SUV Mazda has ever brought to Australia. So this big car has two big questions to answer. Does this Mazda have the features and refinement to justify Mazda's first ever six-figure SUV price tag? And secondly, if so, is it a sneakily affordable alternative to established luxury brands like Audi, BMW, Land Rover and Volvo? I'm Glenn Butler, this is my Mazda CX-90 Azami review and you're watching Drive. Say hello to the new Mazda CX-90. This is a car hell-bent on taking the Mazda brand up market. So much so that it's actually $21,000 more than the CX-9 that it replaces. Now there are three model grades. We've got the Azami here and there are two engine options. We've got the petrol, there's also a diesel. For this car here, the CX-90 Azami, you're looking at $93,655 plus on-road costs. So that's about $102,000 to park it in your driveway before you add the almost $1,000 for this machine grey paint job and $6,500 for the Takumi pack which we've got inside. So in total, $112,000 for this car if you live in Melbourne, $110,000 if you're in Sydney. Okay, now dimensions, and rather than just spout some numbers at you, I want to show you the size differences to the CX-9. So I've got this handy ruler. Compared to the CX-9, this CX-90 is 45 millimeters longer and just 25 millimeters wider. In terms of height, it's practically the same. So really not much difference. The only measurement that has changed is the wheelbase. That's grown by 19 centimetres and that should make a difference dynamically and potentially to interior space. Okay, inside and the Azami Tsunami continues. Now tech highlights include these dual 12.3 inch digital displays which would have been competitive at the Mazda CX-9's old price level but at the CX-90's elevated price some competitors are going bigger and even more impressive on the central digital display. Now, we also have multi-zone climate control in here. And another little bugbear, we've got separate buttons for cooler and warmer, instead of having one button that just does both depending on the direction you hit it. Below the climate control, we've got the obligatory wireless phone charging mat, as you'd expect. A couple of USB-C ports in here to plug in, but it has wireless CarPlay and Android Auto, so you don't really need to. We've got electrically adjustable heated and ventilated front seats. Uh, this car has the $6,500 Takumi pack, which instead of making it seven seats, gives it six seats, three rows of two individual seats, that has this very stylish but very easily marked white napper leather. We also get this, and my jewelry personally is a bit out on the color of this maple wood grain. I'm not sure I'm the biggest fan in the world of that particular color. You might be. In addition, the level of artisan work in here or craftsmanship has really stepped up and it needed to for the price. I'm talking about some, well, if you're being brutal, useless touches, but they do have a an aesthetic aspect, a visual enhancement aspect, so maybe they're not useless after all. This chrome, I'm going to call it the Cadillac chrome fin that's on both doors, I kind of like it. Then we've also got this cloth dashboard treatment, which looks cool, and this very fragile looking stitching in the middle looks really nice too, but I don't know about you, but I just want to keep picking at it to see if I can make it unravel, and that's probably not what you should do with a $110,000 car. Now, infotainment, and bizarrely, Mazda has persisted with a central controller rather than going full touchscreen. But that's only when you're in Mazda's menus. Hook up your smartphone and the screen becomes a touchscreen. But that's only if you're in park. Otherwise, you again have to use the controller. At least the car reprograms the keys around the controller to access those specific sections of the smartphone's menu when you're mirroring. Satellite navigation, for example, go straight to Google Maps or Waze, whichever you prefer. That's clever, but it makes Mazda's decision to force users to navigate the car's own menus only via the controller a bit perplexing. Why not allow both and let the user choose? One innovative new feature is Mazda's personalised system, which will help you set up your driving position. 
That sounds clever, but Mazda's idea of the ideal driving position is not mine. The steering wheel is too far away, the seat is too high, and the mirrors mostly show me the car's doors. On top of that, the facial recognition scan, which is supposed to unlock your settings the next time, doesn't always work. So you sit there like a dopey Dora while your passengers wonder if you've blanked out. A personalised key would be quicker and better. Okay, climbing into the second row here, and because this car has the Takumi pack, as I said, we've got two individual captain's chairs in the second row, not a triple bench seat. Uh, legroom, holy hell, look at this. I've got acres. Um, what to say about it? How much more do you need? Under seat footroom is great too. Obviously, I can adjust this and compromise my own level of comfort to give people in the third row a bit more. But right now there's no one back there, so let's go right back to here. Headroom is a little bit surprising. I'm only 172 centimeters, as you saw, and this feels a little bit tight on. So if someone's 180 centimeters or more back here, I think they might find it a little bit challenging. What's not challenging is the level of comfort and luxury in this middle row. We have the tri-zone climate control, the third zone, two up the front, one in here, which we also have air vents for, which is fantastic. We also have seat heating and seat ventilation as part of the Takumi pack. Two USB-C ports, and then this massive, massive centre console, which has very deep storage in here. We have a little, I guess, phone or pen storage here, a couple of cup holders here, and a nifty little hidden drawer in there to put stuff that you want out of sight. In addition to the cup holders, you've got your bottle holders, two in each door, so plenty of liquid for long journeys. I'm a little bit torn on this center console though. I can't decide if having this much functionality and storage is good, or whether I'd prefer walk-in capability to the back seat. Given how big and bulky it is, it's fixed in. It doesn't come out easily. In fact, I don't think it's meant to at all. So maybe, maybe it is better to have this rather than have walk-through capability. The only other thing I want to bring your attention to here, and it's kind of important in a car that wants to be a family car, window blinds. So when Junior's sleeping, Junior stays sleeping. All right, let's see how easy it is to get into the third row. Okay, third row, one lever back here which tilts and slides in one motion. Ooh, it's a long way up and then it's a long way down. All right, slide this back and I'm in. And you know what? I've actually got a decent amount of room for an adult back here. So I think you could get away with this car as having three rows of adults. Headroom is adequate, tiny bit more to go. I've put this seat in the furthest back position it's got and I have got enough leg room just. Under seat foot room just. I don't have any under thigh support because the ratio of the floor to the seat is way too close. So on long journeys, this is gonna get tiring. But I could alleviate that somewhat by having the second row passenger just give me a bit more comfort or a lot more if they're smaller than me. In terms of other comforts or amenities back here, each side gets two cup holders, which is not too bad. There's also air vents down here on the side, which will blow some air at my face, so that's good. And I've got a USB-C plug on each side. So all in all, decent, good, nothing unexpected, nothing special, nothing particularly luxurious, but comfortable. I think I'll be all right. Okay, now to the boot, and at this price, a hands-free electrically opening tailgate is a must-have. Inside we've got 257 litres of storage, which is about 10% more than the old CX-9. It's good, it's not massive, you'll fit a few bags back here if you're in three-row configuration. It's more than the new Nissan Pathfinder, but if you want more again, maybe check out the Hyundai Palisade. Under here we don't have any more storage. We have a toolkit and we also have the hider for a space saver spare tyre, which will be enough to get you to the tyre shop to fix your flat. Now, an area where I think Mazda's missed. Folding the third row of seats at this price, I would have thought there'd be a couple of buttons here to do it, but instead, it's an easy, but still a manual procedure, which then liberates 608 litres of storage space. And to be honest, that's a pretty decent sized boot for a car of this side. 
If you need more, you can fold the second row down and you've got 2,200 plus litres. It's massive, but you don't have a flat floor and anything you push through is potentially going to mark that Napa leather. Now, what else do we have in the boot here that I want to point out to you? Two things really, three things. We have a domestic power point for charging your laptop on the go and a 12 volt plug here for anything else you need to charge and a couple of shopping hooks or curry hooks or call them whatever you want. All right, I reckon that's enough about the boot. Let's close it and get driving. Okay, now that we're on the move, let's talk about performance. This Mazda CX-90 debuts a new 3.3 litre inline six cylinder engine for Mazda. It has 254 kilowatts of power, 500 newton meters of torque, which is actually 50% more power and 20% more torque than the old four cylinder that it replaces. Now add to that the fact that we've now got an eight speed automatic transmission instead of a six speeder. And as you can imagine, the driving performance is transformed. Even though the CX-90 is 230 kilograms heavier in its heaviest version compared to the heaviest CX-9. It is a smooth powertrain, helped by the fact that there is a 48 volt mild hybrid electric assistance going on. That doesn't save a massive amount of fuel, but it does make a bit of a difference. In all the running around I'm doing for this video, we're averaging about 10.5 litres per hundred. And when you put your foot down, it's got plenty of performance to give. If there is a weakness in the way this car drives, it's how it handles bumps. It's actually got quite a firm ride, and I can't decide if that's Mazda with the old zoom zoom ethos, making sure that the driver feels like this is a driver's car, or whether they've just favored high speed ride and lost a bit in that low speed ride because when you go over road joins and bumps and corrugations, you really do feel it. And I'm not sure that has a place in a $100,000 car. One area where this car has definitely improved is NVH, in cabin ambience. I'm talking about outside noises coming in, tire noise, wind noise. It is silent, it is serene. Now there is one more thing to be aware of. This is a six seater we're in now, but it also comes in seven seats. The Mazda CX-90, because it's heavier, has a bigger gross vehicle mass, but the payload's only around 580 kilos. Why is that important? Well, six of me in this car is a bit over 510 kilos, so that's okay. But put seven of me, if it was a seven seater, and you've exceeded the allowable payload, which means you are operating the car beyond its accepted guidelines. And in some cases, that can cause issues if anything breaks and you're found out. Okay, ooh, a bit of a bumpy round about that one. Now, low speed maneuverability. This car is actually very easy and very agile to maneuver at low speeds. The steering has a nice heft to it when you're driving, but when you drop the speeds, it's really easy to turn the tiller and get into car parks. The car has 360 degree cameras, which makes it easier. But really, it's weakness for me, and I keep coming back to it because I keep going over bumps in the road. I'm not sure the ride is really where it needs to be with this car. I mean, do you agree? Do you think I'm being too harsh on it? Let me know in the comments below because I'm really keen to understand what the market would expect of a $110,000 car. How smoothly should it ride? How well should it isolate occupants from lumps and bumps on the road? Okay, so that kind of sums up this car. But to get to a conclusion, we really need to, to understand where it sits in the market. Now, obviously the price has taken it beyond the Hyundai Palisades and the Kia Sorentos, Hyundai Santa Fe, that it used to rival. And it's put it up into an area where there's actually not a lot of competition in the monocoque SUV seven seat class. I mean, yes, you've got Nissan Patrols, Toyota Land Cruiser Prados, but they have a fair bit of off-road ability, whereas this car's not pretending to be an off-roader. It's really focused on being the best on-road SUV with seven seats that it can. In fact, the Audi Q7 range starts from about $90,000. So the conundrum is real. Is this Mazda as good as the Audi? 
I mean, Mazda's not the only brand that's trying to elevate itself out of that mainstream seven seat market. Jeep is another one that's taken its Grand Cherokee L seriously upmarket in equipment, features, prestige and price. And while I haven't driven the Grand Cherokee L enough to decide, I have driven this Mazda and I do have a verdict on whether Mazda's been successful or not. So let's pull up and let's talk. Mazda has repositioned its premium seven-seater into a market segment that's nowhere near as crowded as the one it left behind. That could be a good thing if buyers are willing to follow Mazda up market and if buyers can equate a $110,000 purchase with a Mazda badge. Those are unknowns for now. What we do know is this Mazda CX-90 Azami is deeply impressive. In terms of practicality, it has the space and flexibility that buyers desire. In terms of driving, it is smooth, effortless, powerful, refined. In terms of safety, it has everything. Features, it has a lot there too, although I do think Mazda's cut a couple of corners that maybe it shouldn't have. What it doesn't have in my opinion though, is any significant or real world innovation that improves the ownership experience or the driving experience. But then maybe that's being too harsh on this car. It certainly offers more than the mainstream that it's left, but it doesn't need to challenge the Audis and BMWs in the mid 100,000s because it's only got a $110,000 price tag. And at that price, I actually think Mazda's done very well and delivered a car that really is worthwhile. Do you agree? If you don't, hit the comments below and tell me why. If you've enjoyed this video and found it useful, do us a favor, hit the like, and please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so when Drive drives new cars, you hear about it first.